I'm not sure if you're similar to me and that you view a lot of history through military campaigns. I think that for me, it is most common that the stages of historical turmoil are often separated by military actions. One kingdom succumbs to another through a series of violent encounters, and then a regime will change and give way to another that will eventually experience the same thing more often than not. Because of this, there's a course a lot of battles to discuss throughout history, and instead of doing it in terms of what my intuition tells me I should do, I want to look at the most disastrous military campaigns in history. Some of these are obvious, and some are pretty interesting. All of them are very badly ended for one side, either for centuries after or completely changed them altogether. Action, violence, swaying of kingdoms and the proverbial pendulum, all of that and more on another episode of The Remedial Scholar. That's ancient history. I feel I was denied critical need to know information. Belongs in a museum, bro. Stop skipping your remedial class. Welcome everyone to another episode of The Remedial Scholar. I am your host Levi and I am happy to be here. I hope everybody is doing well in their holiday shopping. I think I saw 98% of the US population at the mall this weekend, so if you want to avoid that kind of traffic, you should check out the merch store. I mean, why wouldn't you? Uh, it's chock full of fun designs and it's a great way to help the show. Obviously, you don't have to, but if you would like, you know, the link is in the description for you to follow. You can also share with your friends or just share the show in general. Sharing us with your friends is a great way to help us out. Beyond that, uh, reviewing, probably the best other way, if you feel so inclined to do so on whatever app you use. Alright, enough for the begging, on to the real reason you're here. Disastrous, blunderous, foolish. All of these words describe the battles that we're going to be discussing today. We'll be giving a little context to each one and driving in a bit of detail before moving into the results and how it impacted the overall conflict that they were involved in. These battles occurred all throughout history and all across the globe and there's way too many to cover in one episode just so you know. So don't don't be expect, like if you don't hear one, don't be like, ah man, you didn't talk about this one. Well, sorry. There's there's only a billion <laughs> battles to discuss. So the first one is a story of, uh, well, resource management and one of the most bloody battles in all of history. During the Warring States period of ancient China, which lasted from 465 to 221 BCE, this battle unfolded. The Warring States, similar to the period in Japan of the same name, which had taken place much later, essentially a civil war of sorts and everyone vying for control of these places, different factions and states trying to become the one ruler of China. It would actually end at the heels of this battle, or the repercussions from it. In 265 BCE, the Qin initiated a strategic move by attacking the state of Han, capturing Qin Yang, and effectively isolating Han's commandary from its southern heartland. The ensuing years witnessed uh, Qin's relentless efforts isolate Shandang further by seizing crucial mountain passes and fortresses along the Taihang Mountains. In a surprising turn, the commander, Feng Ting, opted to offer the region to the neighboring state of Zhao, strategically west of Zhao's capital, Han Dan. Recognizing the potential threat, King Zhao Chang of Zhao dispatched an experienced general, Liam Po, to lead an army and defend the region from Qin's encroachment. In the year 262 BCE, marked by the commencement of the battle, as the Qin army, led by Wang He, invaded Shandang, compelled, compelling Feng Ting's evacuation, Liam Po, in response, established three defensive lines south of the Changping, Changping Pass. Initial encounters favored Qin, leading to the capture of the Gaoping Pass and other strongholds, causing the collapse of the first defensive line. Adapting to this situation, Liam Po focused on reinforcing positions along the Dan River, initiating a bitter two-year stalemate with the Qin. Despite the massive reinforcement of positions and, and a total combatant count nearing a million by, the, by 260 BCE, both sides faced a protraced impasse. As Liam Po's strategy wore down the Qin's forces, internal issues arose in Zhao. Frustrated by prolonged conflict and influenced by Qin's rumors about Liam Po, King Zhao Chang replaced Liam Po with Zhao Kuo, the overconfident son of the late general Zhao Shi. Zhao Shi. Seizing the opportunity, Qin secretly replaced Wang He with the renowned Bai Bai Qi, known for ruthless efficiency and annihilation in battles. Zhao Kuo, now in command, discarded previous defensive strategies and launched an aggressive move to break the stalemate. The essential idea was to cross the river and go for Qin's flank, but in this attempt had abandoned their camp and left all of their food and supplies. Now, 
You don't need to be Stonewall Jackson to know that abandoning your supplies when your army is half a mil strong is a bad idea. Bai Chi anticipated Zhao Kuo's plan, executing a maneuver reminiscent of the Battle of Kenny, which we will talk about a little bit later. Uh, he purposely led Zhao Kuo to believe his forces had depleted, you know, stretched the lines super thin, and then countered with a hidden troop. Chen encircled and trapped the Zhao forces, cutting off supply lines and dividing the army up. They would try to retreat, but the mountainous region offered little in the way of escape. Instead, they resigned to building impromptu fortifications. After a futile attempt to breach the encirclement, Zhao Kuo's forces suffered heavy casualties, with Bai Chi launching relentless attacks during a 46-day siege. Stricken by hunger and desperation, the exhausted Zhao army resorted to slaughtering horses and allegedly went full donner, resorting to cannibalism. Bai Chi's repeated assault further wore down the besieged forces. In September, Zhao Kuo was killed during a final attempt to breach encirclement, leading to the surrender of the remaining Zhao army. So, over? No, not quite. Post-victory, Bai Chi faced the challenge of handling a large number of prisoners. You might remember, it's half a million soldiers strong, this army. So, what do you do? Well, fearing potential unrest, he ordered the execution of over 450,000 Zhao soldiers, only sparing 240 of the youngest to spread terror. It's pretty intense. Despite Chen's later defeat at the Siege of Handan, the Battle of Champing lasted, had lasting repercussions. The Zhao never recovered from the loss of manpower, while Chen rebounded eventually and achieved dominance over the states, culminating in the unification of China in 221 BCE. This battle stands as a pivotal, uh, pivotal event in the Warring States period, reshaping the geopolitical landscape of ancient China. Pretty intense, right? Losing half a million people? I mean, estimated, like guesstimated. Either way, a lot of times in history, they're gonna, you know, okay, we say we lost this many, but even so, it's usually half, I mean, if on the low end, so <laughs> this is 200, 220,000 soldiers, that's still a big chunk, no wonder that Chin was able to win out over the other conflicts, you have this biggest competing army decimated, you executed all of them, and there's not really any other army that can, uh, you know, stand up to yours at that point. All right. Moving forward a few decades uh, to a different continent, to a place that has captivated all of our collective unconscious on a daily basis. That's right babes, we're going to Rome. This one is nice too because it gets to show people the fallibility of the Roman Empire. It was not just constant domination, I mean it was mostly that. In the times when it was not, we have cases like this where I'm about to tell you. Both of these battles took place during the Second Punic War. Well, what was the Second Punic War? Well, this is the one after the first one. Duh. No. Well, I mean, yes, but there's slightly more to it than that. The First and Second Punic Wars involved the Rome and Carthage. The First Punic Wars ended after about two decades of fighting in 241 BCE. And then there was a few decades of non-fighting until the Second picked back up in 218 BCE. In most lists on the subject, the most disastrous campaigns, uh, the Second Punic War has the privilege of having not one but two battles on them. The Battle of Kenny, which was the most disastrous in terms of planning, and then the Battle of uh, Trasimene. The Battle of Tresemene predated Ken Kenny, and I think it really set up the other losses very well. The combatants from Carthage is a name in which is very famous in Roman history, which is Hannibal. He joined the family business of really giving the Romans the business. His father, Ham his father was Hamilcar. His father was Hamilcar Barca, who was the Carthag Carthaginian instigator of the First Punic War. Hannibal is, of course, most famous for his use of elephants as he crossed the Alps. He did this after fighting his way through Iberia, which is modern-day Spain. The bulk of the war took place on the northern coast of Africa and the western and northwestern coast of the Mediterranean on the west side of Italy and then also it dipped into the Italian peninsula but not primarily there. Now Iberia at the time was not under the umbrella of Rome at this point but Rome had allies in the region and when Hannibal conquered them that was trouble for Rome. These battles all took place in Italy just for reference. Now the first one Lake near Lake Tresemene, which is only a few hours drive from Rome proper. Now, a few other battles had taken place uh, between his crossing of the Alps, but this was the first one where Rome was probably not super pumped about the outlook, and this was only a year into the 17-year-long war. Uh, two battles in two months between the powers of Carthage and Rome occurred in 218 BCE in November and December, the Battle of Trebia being the latter. The next one, next major one wouldn't occur until June of the following year. Following the disheartening outcome of the Battle of Trebia, Rome experienced initial alarm, which was somewhat alleviated with the arrival of Sempronius. Subsequently, the consulship was bestowed 
upon Gnaeus Geminus and Gaius Flaminus, heralding a surge in war preparations. The consuls, elected, uh, the consuls elect embarked on a comprehensive strategy, recruiting legions, reinforcing key locations, constructing, constructing a formidable naval fleet, and establishing, establishing vital supply depots. Now, the fleet thing is interesting because the biggest part about Hannibal's strategy was, I'm not even going to play with the water. Like, he didn't even worry about it. And I think that is very important because Rome did dump a lot of resources into being a naval power at this point. You might remember from the Pirates episode, but just something to keep in mind. They spread their resources pretty far out, and then he didn't even use what they spread half of their resources to, essentially. So, in the spring of 217 BCE, Hannibal and the Carthaginians traversed the Apennines, catching the Romans off guard with an unexpected route through Etruria. Flaminus, in eager pursuit, believed he was chasing fleeing, fleeing Carthaginians. The Romans, oblivious to the Carthaginian presence, hastily marched without conducting proper recon, which is, you know, never a good idea. It would have taken, you know, a handful of horsemen to run through this area and then find out that there was an entire army lurking. <laughs> Seizing the opportunity, Hannibal recognized that he had eluded his pursuers orchestrated his masterful ambush at Lake Tresemine. Under the cover of night, the Carthaginians executed a strategic march, pos positioning themselves discreetly behind hills along the north shore. On June 21st, 217, the unsuspecting Romans advancing along the lake unwittingly walked right into the trap. Carthaginians launched a devastating assault from both flank and rear, plunging the Roman ranks into disarray. The ensuing chaos resulted in numerous casualties, captives, and desperate attempts by Romans to escape, some ending tragically in drowning as they tried to swim across the lake. As with many historical battles, the numbers are very sporadic and in hard factual data, but the Romans are said to have had around 30,000 men who were all killed or captured with the larger 50,000 strong Carthaginians only taking around 2,500 casualties. And these numbers seem pretty close to accurate considering how massively devastating surprise attacks like this were are, uh, were to armies that are pretty much evenly matched. That kind of thing can take two armies that are pretty competitive in their numbers and tilt it just really heavily to one side. The reverberations of the defeat at Lake Tresemine spread back through Rome, sparking panic. In response, Quintus Fabius Maximus assumed the role of dictator and adopted a Fabian strategy named after him, emphasizing avoidance of direct conflict. Meanwhile, Hannibal continued his devastating incursions into Apulia, culminating in Rome's most catastrophic military defeat in the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC. Luckily, this next one is from the same war, so I don't need a bunch of setup. Cannae was targeted by Hannibal because of its supply stores. Mention, I mentioned that Rome was kind of bolstering their supplies a little bit earlier. Well, this is one of those places. And not only did it benefit Hannibal by consuming, taking those supplies, but it also caused distress, further distress across Rome because Kenny was not just a supply store location, but it was essentially the Roman version of a state capital. It was a regional power, and with it being such a pivotal regional power, the news spread in this made the rest of no Rome, the rest of Nome, very nervous. The rest of Rome, very nervous, and for good reason. The prelude to actual battle consisted of Hannibal deploying cavalry to dissuade troops from taking water back to the camps, which is, it just kind of sets up the frust frustration at the Roman camps. You know, <laughs> oh, we're just trying to get some water, and this guy won't even let us drink, dude. At the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal employed a strategic formation, creating a crescent-shaped deployment with Hispanic and Celtic troops in the center, gradually withdrawing to lure the Romans deeper. The Carthaginians. Carthaginian cavalry gained an advantage on the flanks, and when the Roman inf infantry advanced, Hannibal orchestrated a controlled retreat, forming a tight semicircle around the Romans. In the dust-filled battlefield, the Roman visibility was hindered, and psychological factors, including lack of sleep and thirst, complicated the infantry's experience. That's what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> we, we can't even get water, we're, <laughs> we're thirsty, we're tired, and now we're half, half encircled. The Carthaginians, de deliberately withdrawing, turned turned the Roman infantry strength into a weakness, causing them to lose cohesion. Hannibal's African infantry, initially uncommitted, now encircled the Romans in a pincer movement. Simultaneously, Car Carthaginian cavalry attacked from the rear, and the Roman infantry found themselves enclosed, leading to a total massacre. Casualties were devastating to Rome, with estimates ranging from 50 to 70,000 infantry killed and 370 of the 6,000 cavalry surviving. Carthaginian losses were reported around 8,000. Now this really makes me think of campaigning in the Total War Rome 
game, which I brought up in a few episodes, but the main one was the very first episode of the show, the War Dogs episode, that, you know, inspired that episode anyway. Some of the strategies utilized in this battle are things I've definitely done in that game, which is kind of fun to see it work in a generated way. Like, it's hard to visualize visualize these things a lot of the pictures are just like squares on a map and you're like okay cool <laughs> like what what does that do for me not a whole lot but um but having the enemy army essentially wrap around your advancing army after both starting out at a pretty flat front is pretty bad news <laughs> the aftermath saw rome in disarray losing a significant portion of its male population and facing revolts in southern italy hellenistic provinces joined hannibal's cause and philip v of macedon pledged support rome's morale plummeted and but the city resisted despair raising new legions and mobilizing the population now, hannibal despite the catastrophic defeat of rome chose not to march on rome opting more for negotiations the romans refused to parley and intensified their efforts and maintained resilience the war in italy continued with occasional battles and uh, the f uh, fabian strategy that i mentioned before eventually leading to hannibal's retreat in the final confrontation in, at Zama, where Rome emerged victorious, ending the Second Punic War. Now, the turning point of the Second Punic War favoring Rome can be c attributed to several key factors. Firstly, Scipio Africanus initiated a successful campaign in Spain against Hannibal's brother, Hasdrubal Barca, with victories at the Battle of Bacula in 208 and later at Alipia in 206 disrupting the Carthaginian control of Spain. Basically this guy worked backwards like the way that Hannibal moved Scipio <laughs> basically followed him but like at a at a few years distance right. So as Hannibal's routing through Italy doing his thing Scipio's moving through Spain, Iberia you know that area and just conquering and cutting off crucial supplies and things that the Carthaginians needed to continue in in Italy. Now after Scipio had done his thing in Spain, he secured Spain and then slid down into North Africa and then pushed the Carthaginian influence out of there also. And this put pressure on Hannibal to move focus away from Italy. Now the war officially concluded with the signing of the Treaty of Peace in 201. Carthage under harsh terms surrendered its fleet and overseas territory, faced severe military limitations, and paid indemnities to Rome. Rome emerged as the dominant power in western Mediterranean because of this, and all of this ended in Rome, you know, winning the Second Punic War after a very, very harsh first half. <laughs> like they had us in the first half, not gonna lie. The next entry demonstrates why it's important to have a unified front in your army. The Byzantine Empire had been the Eastern Roman Empire, as you may remember, that shifted eventually. Being the Eastern part of the once Roman Empire, their foes were often of that of the Muslim countries to the East, the Middle East, you know. And in the 7th century CE, the Byzantine Empire found themselves at odds with a force led by Khalid al-Walid. This was part of a larger ongoing war known as the Byzantine Arab Wars, which began following the death of the Muslim Muslim prophet Muhammad in 632 CE. Byzantine Arab wars spanning the 7th to 11th centuries were a prolonged and dynamic struggle for dominance in the eastern Mediterranean uh, between the Byzantine Empire and the emerging Arab Muslim forces. These conflicts driven by religion, political and uh, territorial ambitions played a pivotal role in shaping the geopolitical landscape of the region. Beginning in the 7th set beginning in the 7th century after the death of the prophet Muhammad in 632 as I mentioned, the Islamic Caliphate guided by Rashidun Caliph initiated a mission to propagate Islam and establish political dominance. Visionary leaders such as Khalid al-Walid Walid, visionary leaders such as Khalid al-Walid and later Caliph Umar led fo Muslim forces in swift conquests capturing key territories like Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. These early triumphs, executed under the banner of the Rashidun Caliphs, fundamentally altered the power balance in the Eastern Mediterranean. Religious fervor and the geopolitical ambition were intertwined during the initial conquest as the Islamic Caliphate sought to consolidate influence through territorial expansion. The clash between Byzantine Empire and the Arab forces intensified as both sides vied for control over strategic territories and religious influence. Throughout the centuries-long conflict, the Byzantine Arab Wars witnessed fluctuating fortunes, territorial exchanges, and shifts in power dynamics. Now, the convergence of political, religious, and territorial motivations turned to 
turn the conflict into a crucible, shaping it, shaping the destiny of the Eastern Mediterranean. And this protracted struggle left an indelible mark on the region's history, influencing cultural, political, and religious trajectories for centuries to come. One of the biggest battles during this time was the Battle of Yarnuk, a pivotal engagement of 636 CE emerged as a seminal event during the initial phase of the Arab Muslim expansion into the Byzantine Empire. Now this uh, battle took place on the uh, banks of the Yarnuk River, spanning contemporary Jordan and Syria. At the helm of the Muslim forces stood Khalid al-Walid, a celebrated military strategist renowned for his pivotal roles in early Islamic conquests. On the Byzantine side, Vehan, I think is how it's pronounced, a seasonal jet, a, a seasonal he only does it in the winter. Actually, it's not completely untrue. A seasoned general appointed by Emperor Her Heraclius assumed command, adding an additional layer of complexity to the impending conflict. Khalid's tactical brilliance mass materialized through a master stroke, a maneuver intended to concentrate Muslim forces for a divisive showdown. This strategic move compelled Byzantine to consolidate their five armies, including introducing logistical complexities into this equation. The Byzantines, faced with the challenge of sustaining their formidable army station at Yarmouk Plain, encountered, encountered a bunch of logistical hurdles. The proximity of Damascus, their nearest base, proved inadequate for the proved inadequate for their needs. Tensions among Byzantine commanders escalated, fueled by long-standing ecclesiastical feuds and internal power struggles, creating an environment fraught with mistrust between the commanders, which is not what you want. The battleground itself was divided into four sections, with each side mirroring the opposite in deployments. Conflict unfolded over several days, marked by strategic phases of attacks and counterattacks that heightened the complexity of this engagement. Estimates of the involved troops range wildly, obviously. Contemporary accounts of the Byzantine Empire reached 200,000, while the Muslim army held around 40,000. Now, modern estimates put the Byzantine strength at 40 to 150,000, which is you know, pretty drastic on the high end. And then they have the Muslim army, army at 15 to 40,000. So that didn't really change a whole lot. I mean, even if you split the difference, <laughs> it's very drastically. So on the first day, the initial encounters witnessed limited engagements, prompting both armies to retreat to their respective camps at sundown. Day two, Byzantine attempts to gauge Muslim strength were met with the with Khalid's strategic counterattacks, disrupting the Byzantine plans and setting the tone for the unfolding conflict. Day three, Byzantine endeavors to breach Muslim positions were met with strategic finesse by Khalid, stabilizing the situation and laying the groundwork for sub subsequent divisive actions. Now, the biggest day, biggest day of all of them uh, arrived on day six as Khalid orchestrated a bold offensive driv driving the Byzantine cavalry off the battlefield he exposed vulnerable infantry flanking attacks and intricate maneuvers resulted in the collapse of the Byzantine wings and center the Muslims encircled the Byzantines and initiated in a uh, in encircled the Byzantines initiating a general retreat that culminated in the resounding victory for Khalid the Battle of Yarmouk witnessed a critical factor in the Byzantine defeat, the internal discord that I mentioned before, the lack of cooperation amongst the generals. The Byzantine army, facing a formidable force, struggled with internal tensions and mistrust among the commanders. One of the key challenges stemmed from the long-standing feuds that I mentioned. Among these commanders, personal rivalries and conflicting interests exacerbated the already complex military situation. These generals failed to forge a unified front and collaborate effectively, leading to a disjoint and command structure. Lack of cohesion became evident in the logistical and strategic aspects of the battle. Khalid's strategic brilliance in concentrating Muslim forces for a divisive battle forced the Byzantines to gather their armies. However, as mentioned, these logistical challenges kind of threw this whole defense into <laughs> or out of whack. And also, really important to note, they had a large army and this army was unfamiliar with the terrain in which they were fighting also. So that's not great. You know, the Byzantine commanders, instead of presenting a unified front, found themselves basically at each other's throats most of the time, refusing to send their troops or back up the other ones. These would lead to things like a hindrance in communication, like they wouldn't communicate effectively with the other generals. The planning, their planning was all thrown out because they couldn't decisively make decisions to work with one another on the flip side obviously Khalid had things pretty down pat he's ready to go he's got everything lined up exactly how he wants to be and that it was just I guess just complete opposites in the situation despite having massive massive numbers on their side Byzantine and their infighting generals 
could not manage to defeat a guy who had a very cohesive and well-trained group. Now, some of the estimates between um, some of the estimates of the losses put around 4,000 on the uh, Muslim Arab army, and then anywhere from modern sources estimate around 40,000 on the Byzantine side, while contemporary sources range from 70 to 120,000 range. So I'm going to go ahead and say like half their army because that seems like a good like a good estimate. Like 40 to 40 to 120,000 on a 40 to 250,000 size army or something depending on which source. I mean, that's pretty drastic. All right. So next up, we're going to move forward to the 12th century in the heart of the Crusades. It's, you know, definitely need their own episode because they're convoluted and messy. This particular event was one of the more disastrous bits for the Crusades which is fine because the entire crusade was a disaster. If you were unaware, the Crusades, a series of religious wars initiated by European Christians, aimed to reclaim and secure Christian holy, holy sites in the Holy Land from Muslim control. The First Crusade, starting in 1096 CE, saw the capture of Jerusalem in 1099, establishing the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. Subsequent Crusades aimed at maintaining or expanding Christian territories, often facing uh, challenges and many setbacks. Mid-internal conflict, Amid internal conflicts within the Kingdom of Jerusalem, including power struggles between factions led by individuals like uh, Guy of Lusignan and Raymond III of Tripoli, and external threats from Muslim leaders like Saladin, tensions escalated. The Battle of Hattin in 1187 proved a turning point where Saladin's forces decisively defeated the Crusaders. This loss, coupled with earlier events like the Battle of Crescent, weakened Crusader morale and territorial control, leading to the eventual fall of Jerusalem to Saladin later in 1187. In 1186, Guy of Lusignan became the king of Jerusalem through his wife, Sibylla, succeeding her son, Baldwin V. The kingdom of Jerusalem witnessed internal divisions with Guy leading the court faction and Raymond III of Tripoli heading the nobles faction. The factions were fueled by secession disputes and political rivalries. Saladin, having gained significant control over Muslim territories, aimed to unite his subjects under Sunni Islam and, and expel the Christian Franks from Jerusalem. Rumors circulated among the Franks that Raymond III had made an agreement with Saladin, adding complexity to the political landscape of these uh, battles. In 1187, Reynald of Chatelon, uh had a raid on a Muslim caravan, violated a truce with Saladin. The subsequent Battle of Crescent resulted in a significant defeat for the Crusaders. Saladin then laid siege to, the, to Tiberius, leading to strategic debates among the Crusaders. Despite warnings, Guy advanced uh, against Saladin, influenced by Gerard de Redefort's advice. This decision, shaped by political conflicts and reluctance to disband the army, ultimately set the stage for pivotal Battle of Hattin in July of 1187. On July 3rd, the Frankish armies, led by Guy, marched towards Tiberias, harassed harassed by Muslim archers and faced severe water scarcity. Realizing they wouldn't reach Tiberias by nightfall, Raymond of Tripoli and Guy changed course towards the springs of Kafar Hattin. The Muslims strategically positioned themselves between the Franks and water sources, forcing the Crusaders to camp overnight in an arid plateau near Maskana. During the night, the Muslims demoralized the Crusaders through prayers, songs, and fire, exacerbating their thirst. Play free bird! On July 4th, blinded by smoke from fireworks, probably, the Crusaders faced Muslim archer attacks advised by Gerard and Reynald. Guy's brother Amalric formed a battle lines and engaged and the engagement began. Thirsty and demoralized, Crusaders attempted to reach the springs of Hattin, but were surrounded by Saladin's for forces, blocking any retreat. Count Raymond managed to reach the Lake of Tiberias, while Guy's situation worsened. Christian infantry deserted, and despite desperate charges, the Crusaders were defeated. Many were killed, and others taken prisoner. Guy, Amalric, Reynald, and other barons were among the captives. In Saladin's tent, he offered water for Guy, a sign of mercy, but Guy, unaware of the custom, passed it to Reynald, accusing uh, Saladin accused Reynald of breaking the truce, leading conflicting, uh, leading to conflicting reports of his execution, either by Saladin's hand or his guards. Guy was spared, as kings do not kill kings, allegedly. You know, a little, little red baron class from Saladin. Following the Battle of Hattin, significant losses befell the Crusaders. The true cross was inverted on a lance and sent to Damascus. Crusader King Guy was captured and taken to Dismas Damascus, later released in 1188. Other noble captives were eventually ransomed. Reynald of Chatelon was like, executed, but Saladin spared and treated the remaining captive barons humanely. All Templar knights were executed by decapitation. 
except the Grand Master of the Temple. Tricopolis, locally recruited mounted archers, were also executed under Saladin's orders, believing them to be Christian converts from Islam. Saladin focused, uh, Saladin followed Islamic jur jurisprudence, considering it punishable by death. The rest of the captured knights and soldiers were sold into slavery, some reportedly for the price of sandals, which is not, I mean, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be sold in slavery, slavery, you don't wanna be the price of sandals. That doesn't seem good. I don't know. High-ranking Frankish barons captured were held in Damascus and treated well, while others, while others took lower-ranking prisoners as slaves, as mentioned. On July 5th, Saladin marched to Tiberias, and Countess Eshiva surrendered the citadel. Raymond of Tripoli, who had escaped the battle, later died of pleurisy. The defeat left the Crusaders with little reserve to defend against Saladin's forces. Only about 200 knights escaped the battle total. Out of 20,000 estimated men, the Crusaders lost most of them. The aftermath saw Saladin capturing 52 towns and fortifications including Acre, Nablus, Haffa, Torun, Sidon, Beirut, and Ascalon by mid-September. Tyr was saved by Conrad Montferrat, while Jerusalem was defended briefly and later surrendered to Saladin on October 2nd. So, pretty interesting. The Crusades, there's too much going on in those things, dude. They're like, and it's kind of weird because it's kind of an extension of the Byzantine Arab Wars, because, well, I guess for the, you know, the Muslim side, but it's just very interesting. Anyway, the next entry takes us to the time of one previous episode, Miss Joan of Arc. During the Hundred Years War, it doesn't take place while she was actively involved in the conflict, rather it takes place a few years after she was born. And, you know, again, since she was only 13, or, <laughs> and again, since she was only 19 when she died, that doesn't help really to clarify, but she was only three when this battle happened, so she definitely wasn't involved. But I digress. If you recall from the Joan episode, you'll remember that before she was involved, things were pretty bleak for the French's de Fries. If you're unaware, the Hundred Years' War, a prolonged conflict spanning from 1337 to the 15th century, emerged from disputes over territorial claims, economic interests, and the succession, succession to the French throne. Several significant events paved the way for the Battle of Ag Agincourt. In 1415, Edward III of England initiated the war by asserting his claim to the French crown, setting off tensions and hostilities. Early battles such as the Battle of Crecy in 1346 and the Battle of Poitiers in 1356 witnessed notable victories for the English under the leadership of Edward the Black Prince, the dude from, he's the, he's the guy that knights, what's his name, in A Knight's Tale. The Treaty of Bretigny in 1360 marked the conclusion of the war's first phase, granting extensive territories to England and acknowledging Edward III's sovereignty over them. However, renewed hostilities erupted due to disputes and power struggles leading to events like the famous Siege of Orléans that involved Joan of Arc later on. In 1415, Henry V of England launched a military campaign in France aiming to reinforce English claims to the French throne. Despite successfully capturing Harfleur during the Siege of Harfleur, Henry V faced a few challenges including disease and dwindling forces. The ensuing conflict took place in late October of 1415. On the morning of October 25th, Henry V deployed his English army consisting of approximately 1,500 men-at-arms men and 7,000 longbowmen, which was, you know, the pride of England's army at this time. These English longbowmen were, are like, super famous. The army was divided into three groups, with the right wing led by Edward, Duke of York, the center led by Henry himself, and the left wing under Baron Thomas Camoy. Archers were under command of Sir Thomas Erbingham. The English likely adopted their usual battle line position, longbowmen on flanks, with men-at-arms and knights in the center, and possibly some archers in the center as well. Before the battle, the English made their confessions, and Henry ordered his men to spend the night in silence to maintain focus. Gotta get in that battle mindset, man. Henry delivered a speech emphasizing the justness of their cause and the historical successes of English kings against the French. French army composed of around 10,000 men-at-arms and around and four to five thousand miscellaneous footmen organized in two main groups, a vanguard and a main battle. The French also had an elite cavalry force to break the English archers formations and smaller mounted force to attack the English rear. Disputes and a desire for glory led many French lords to mass in the front lines with archers crossbowmen placed behind them the fields narrowness and muddy terrain favored the english as the battle unfolded the french cavalry disorganized and unable to outflank the longbowmen or charge through the sharp sharpened stakes protecting them suffered disastrous defeat the french men-at-arms wearing plate armor closed in on english lines but faced a hail of arrows and if the arrows did or did not penetrate the you know the very thick plate armor probably it probably hit a lot of the uh, 
the gaps is, you know, with just the massive volley of arrows flying through, you're going to hit gaps. I don't know about hitting through the armor itself, but maybe these longbows were <laughs> pretty intense. They got a lot of force behind them. But any, either way, the French weighed down by their armor were stuck in this slop of mud. Very similar to how Magellan was stuck in the uh, the muddy beach in the Philippines. Like, is a very similar situation to that. Their terrain also restricted the French's ability to uh, use their numerical advantage effectively. The French men-at-arms reached the front of the English line, pushing it back. When the archers ran out of arrows, they engaged the now disordered French men-at-arms using hatchets, swords, and mallets. They exhausted French forces, unable to lift their weapons, or fighting over fallen comrades, or just completely overwhelmed. The only French success was the attack on the uh, lightly protected British baggage train, seizing some of Henry's personal treasures. After initial victory, after the initial English victory, Henry, fearing a French regrouping, ordered the slaughter of the French prisoners, sparing only the highest of ranks. This decision, aimed at preventing prisoners from overwhelming the exhausted English forces, resulted in the deaths of several thousand French captives. Out of the potentially 25,000 French involved, the Battle of Agincourt resulted in a catastrophic defeat for the French, with around 6,000 of their fighting men dead, including numerous military and political leaders. Casualties included three dukes, nine counts, and one viscount, along with the constable, admiral, master of crossbowmen, and other high-ranking officials. The heralds reported around 3,069 knights and squires killed, along with 2,600 unidentified corpses. Entire noble families were wiped out, and the battle had a profound impact on French society. Estimates of French prisoners ranged from 700 to 2,200, including notable figures such as the Duke of Orléans and Bourbon. English casualties were comparatively lower with around with at least 112 killed including the duke of york and the earl of sussex while the victory was militarily decisive it was its immediate impact did not further the english conquest as henry v prioritized his return to england triumph established the legitimacy of the lancastrian monarchy and facilitated future english campaigns in france obviously we know after this there was a lot of infighting from the armanacs and the burgundians after um, and then eventually, the Hundred Years' War continued with fluctuations in power dynamics exemplified by the Treaty of Troyes in 1420, recognizing Henry V as their heir to the French throne. However, the war persisted with Joan of Arc's influence and eventual capture ultimately contributing to the end of the English dominance and the French kind of turned the tide after that. All right, let's jump out of medieval Europe and show these people how some good old-fashioned Americans lose a battle. <laughs> Am I right? No? Yeah, well, too bad. I could make it easy and talk about Gettysburg or any number of the Confederate defeats. We all know or should know how Sherman took it to them on several glorious occasions. But no, this next battle is one that is a little more intriguing, a little more messy. In the 19th century, there were a lot of conflicts which occurred when left battle scars all across the geography of the United States. A lot of it took place during the Civil War, but also battles within, you know, with native populations checkered the West, where places like the Dakotas, Montana Territories, and Wyoming, uh, and others were some of the sites of the most decisive battles as the gold rush pushed the American citizens west. This example also tells a story about how truly the winners of overall wars and conflict conflicts can write the history because there are a few things that have been spun into positive for some of the people involved. The Battle of L Little Bighorn, erroneously sometimes known as Custer's Last Stand, unfolded as a significant event in amid the tumultuous backdrop of the Great Sioux War of 1876. In the mid-19th century, the United States government entered a series of treaties with the Native American tribes, among them the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. This accord earmarked the, earmarked the Great Sioux Reservation and assured the Lakota Sioux ownership of the Black Hills. However, the allure of gold in the Black Hills beckoned settlers, breaching the treaty's terms and kindling tensions. Of course, yeah, obviously, you can have this area. We're going to kick you off the place you live now. We're going to seclude you here. And then we're going to find out, hey man, there's some gold there that we want, so we're going to kick you out even further. Um, as settlers encroached further onto Native American lands, conflicts intensified, naturally. The United States government sought to combine the Plains Indians, as they were known to them, including the Lakota Sioux, Cheyenne, Arapaho, 
uh, two reservations. This endeavor encountered staunch opposition from indigenous leaders like Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, and Gaul, sparking the Sioux Wars from 1854 to 1890, marked by sporadic skirmishes and conflicts between the Plains and the Plains Indians and the United States military. Leaders advocated for the preservation of traditional ways of life amidst attempts to relocate tribes to reservations. Significant engagements including the Battle of Rosebud in June 17, 1876 predated the Battle of Little Bighorn, obviously. Here, General Cook's forces clashed with Native American warriors, setting the stage for the larger. Concurrently, the Native American tribes hosted cultural and religious events such as Sundance fostering unity and resistance. Sitting Bull, spiritual leader of the Lakota Sioux, reportedly foresaw massive conflict during a Sundance of visiting soldiers, quote, falling into his camp like grasshoppers from the sky. The Valley of Little Bighorn became a focal point and designated as part of the Crow Indian Reservation on May 7, 1868. Skirmishes ensued between the Sioux and Crow tribes, escalating in 1876 when the Sioux entered the valley without Crow consent, prompting the Crow to align with the United States Army. In response to Native American resistance, the United States government devised a three-pronged approach featuring military campaigns to compel the Lakota and the Cheyenne back to reservations. Colonel George Armstrong Custer led one prong, opting for an independent and swift maneuver to surprise and confront the Native American tribes. This context sets the stage for the Battle of Little Bighorn, a monumental confrontation uh, des destined to etch its place in history as a defining moment in the relentless struggle between Plains Indians and the westward expanding forces of the United States. In the Battle of in the lead up to the Battle of Little Bighorn, the Army's coordination faced challenges beginning with General Crook's retreat at the Battle of Rosebud on June 17, 1876. Despite holding the field, Crook was surprised by a large number of Native Americans, withdrew his group and awaited reinforcements. Unaware of Crook's situation, General Gibbons and Terry continued their advance intending to converge near the Bighorn and Little Bighorn Rivers. By late June, Terry ordered Custer's 7th Cavalry to scout the Rosebud with the option to deviate from orders based on Custer's judgment. That's an important factor here. On June 24th, Custer scouts positioned at Crow's Nest spotted a vast Native American encampment about 15 miles away. Custer contemplated a surprise attack but received reports of hostiles discovering his trail. Concerned about an immediate threat, Custer divided his forces into three battalions under Major Reno, Captain Benteen, and himself. Unaware that the Native American group on his trail was leaving the encampment, Custer decided to attack without delay, fearing the village might disperse. The morning of June 25th saw the division of Custer's companies preparing for the impending engagement. The Army's pre-battle assumptions influenced by the inaccurate information or misunderstanding of information miscalculated the number of Native Americans they would encounter. Custer relied on estimates that failed to consider quote-unquote reservation Indians who had uh, joined the non-reservation tribes, resulting in the unawareness of the significant Native American forces awaiting him. As Custer approached Little Big Horn, he observed only the pony herd and underestimating the warriors' presence due to a misinterpretation of their activity. Custer's strategy aimed at engaging non-combatants in the encampments, intending to capture hostages, innocent men, women, and um, children, as well as disabled people, <laughs> and he was going to use them as hostages to pressure the warriors into surrendering. His battalions were positioned to ride into the camp, secure non-combatant hostages, counting on striking consternation among the warriors. Custer believed the close proximity of women and children would favorably influence peace negotiations. Custer faced challenges as he sought to capture women and children. Uh, fearing detection, he abandoned his initial plan to scout the village before attacking. Custer's intent was to attack swiftly before the village dispersed and with that belief, uh, with the belief that Benteen would with a pack train would provide support eventually. All right, so in the historic clash at Little Bighorn, Major Reno led his detachment into action, driven by the orders of Custer to engage the Sioux tribe's village. However, the lack of precise information regarding the village's size and location proved to be a critical oversight as Reno's forces approached. They were met with the startling realization that they were up against a much larger and more formidable Native American presence than initially anticipated. In response to the unexpected situation, Reno sensing a potential trap swiftly ordered his men to dismount and assumed a skirmish line formation. Despite these tactical adjustments, the Native Americans holding a numerical advantage over Reno's detachment launched a fierce counterattack, compelling a rapid and disorderly retreat. The withdrawal was not without cost as casualties began to mount with and wounded soldiers were regrettably abandoned in the chaotic aftermath. 
amidst the turmoil, Captain Benteen arrived later to reinforce Reno's belie beleaguered forces on the strategic vantage uh, point of Reno Hill, named <laughs> later on, obviously. <laughs> Despite the ominous sounds of the gunfire emanating from the north, Benteen focused on shoring up the defense position rather than advancing towards Custer's location. The troops now stationed at the bluffs valiantly defended themselves against the persistent assaults that continued until the cover of nightfall. The details surrounding Custer's actions in the Battle of Little Bighorn remain largely speculative due to the absence of survivors from his immediate command and the accounts from surviving native americans while valuable are contradictory sometimes and unclear as well while the sounds of gunfire heard by reno and benteen's men on june 25th likely emanated from custer's fight those stationed in reno on reno hill remained unaware of his fate until general terry's arrival on june 27th upon examining the custer's battle site the army struggled to piece together events Given the lack of organized resistance and the removal of most Native American casualties, the soldiers found Custer's dead stripped, ritually mutilated, and in a state of decomposition, complicating the identification. Custer's own body bore two fatal gunshots with the possibility of a post-mortem head wound. Lakota oral history suggests the controversial notion that Custer may have committed suicide to avoid capture. So, just adding. <laughs> Just adding to the uh, potential, or to the confusion of this event. As mentioned, various accounts diverge on Custer's movements during the battle. Some propose they attempted to ford the river at Medicine Tail, while others asserted that he never approached the river, continuing north across Cooley. Archaeological findings and reassessed Native American testimony indicate the possibility of a divided Custer force and a faint attack southwest from the Nye Cartwright Ridge. The debate continues over whether Custer engaged in an organized attack or was forced into a retreat. Custer's final resistance on Last Stand Hill, although portrayed traditionally as a last stand, is challenged by modern archaeology, suggesting that his troops were overwhelmed by a single charge rather than being surrounded and fighting to the death in that fashion. The battle's closing segment, marked by desperate stands of volley fire, saw the majority of the Native American casualties at that point. The fate of Custer and his men remains a complex and debated chapter in this uh, on in these series of battles. After Custer's forces suffered a decisive defeat, the Lakota and Northern Cheyenne regrouped and to engage Reno and Benteen. The battle extended until the evening of June 25th and throughout the following day. With the outcome remaining uncertain, Reno attributed Benteen's fortunate defense against a severe attack on the perimeter held by different companies to his control. On June 27th, General Terry's column approached from the north, leading leading the natives to retreat. Crow Scout White Man Runs Him was the which great name. Uh that's that's his name. That's his name. White Man Runs Him was the first to inform General Terry's officers of Custer's force being wiped out. Reno and Benteen's wounded troops received limited treatment and five eventually succumbed to their injuries. The news of Custer's defeat reached those uh, aboard the steamboat Far West, a supplier for the expedition. Curley, one of the Custer scouts, relayed the information to Captain Grant Marsh, who swiftly converted the Far West into a floating hospital, transporting wounded to Fort Lincoln in record time. News of the quote-unquote Custer massacre spread rapidly to the east, coinciding with the U.S. Continental ce celebrations, or coinciding with the United States Centennial celebrations, an army investigation commenced facing challenges due to concerns for survivors and officers reputation custer's wife elizabeth bacon custer vehemently defended his heroic image and while the battle of little bighorn marked a pivotal moment for both natives and the it, the relationship with the government uh it indicated the beginning of the end of the quote-unquote indian wars within 48 hours large encampment dispersed due to resource constraints ogallala sioux black elk described as described the exodus narrative narrating the flight along greasy grass which is little big that's also known as this the Battle of Greasy Grass. After celebratory events, many natives returned to the reservation and the worry count decreased for to around 600. Generals Crook and Terry awaited reinforcements before resuming action in August under leadership of General Nelson A. Miles in October. The Great Sioux War continued 
concluded in May 1877 with a defeat of, of a Minikanju Sioux band. The ownership of the Black Hills, a focal point of the conflict, was determined by an ultimatum from the Many Penny Commission. The Sioux yielded Baja Sapa to the United States under the threat of starvation, rejecting the legitimacy of the transaction. The Sioux pursued their claim through lobbying and litigation, leading the United States Supreme Court's acknowledgement of the unjust taking of the Black Hills. The Sioux declined, compens Sioux declined compensation and persisted in asserting their right to the land. Although the cavalry showed up with around 700 men in total, and Custer had wildly underestimated the native response and did not use the scouts he had to his advantage, this led to almost 270 of the 700 being killed in battle with 55 wounded while the 11 to 2500 na native army lost anywhere from 31 to 300 total in the skirmish which you know still left left them with a massive strength in, compar com in comparison. I spoke on the fact that the name Custer's Last Stand is erroneous and this is due to the fact that after his death as mentioned his widow had campaigned to illuminate his name by writing books telling his stories to journalists and anyone who would write the write them and embellish a lot basically spinning it into he's like this huge hero he fought to the bitter end to do xyz blah 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 and this continued until it was commonplace in school textbooks in the early 20th century even and some variations of the story are probably still being taught incorrectly to this day because of this they make Custer appear as a hero, although we don't have any conclusive t contemporary accounts of how he acted in the battle, we just know that his strategy was not great since he ended up on this list. He ignored serious warnings from the native scouts who were assisting him and did not wait until the actual proper head of the campaign, Brigadier General Alfred Terry, and his troops arrive before advancing. Granted, he was given permission to do so upon his judgment, but was his judgment good? No, obviously not. <laughs> anyway. I mean, good for the natives though. So that's it for this one. Obviously have tons of other ones to talk about because every war has terrible decisions and this is just exacerbated about the fact that there have been wars forever. So I'm certain we will revisit this topic again at a later time. Did you learn anything new? Did it illuminate some things that you already knew? Drop a comment in the Facebook group or on the video, on the YouTube video. Uh, and let me know what you think. As always, don't forget to check out all the social media options we have. Share us with your friends. Post memes in the Facebook group. Engage with other listeners. If you have a topic you'd like to hear about, let me know. Email me. I also still have stickers for sale, so you can email me for those too. Email me, remedialscholar at gmail.com. And thank you again for all your support. I really do appreciate it. Uh, that And like it, it means a lot. So that's it for today's episode. If you learned anything, I hope what is I hope that it was that you should not fight in the mud when heavily armored. Listen to your scouts. And if you're splitting command duties with another person, maybe work together with them. Anyway, let curiosity fuel you and I will see you next time. Bye.